Uh, before I, I introduce uh, formally our event and speaker tonight, I do want to take a moment to thank those of you who have made contributions to support the Bird Center in recent weeks and months. Um, our programs are donator, do, our programs are donor supported, uh, and our initiatives are donor supported, and we can't conduct them without your ongoing uh, generosity. So we very much appreciate that. And if you haven't made a contribution, but you enjoy tonight's program and you would like to see more of them, or if you've enjoyed past Bird Center programs and you want to see more of them, please visit our website, birdcenter.org, and uh, go ahead and make a contribution to support the center. And as we get into the, the last few months of this uh, crazy year, I do also want to remind you that all of those uh, contributions are tax deductible. So we very much appreciate them. Tonight, we are privileged to be joined by Dr. Kate Scott, uh, who will discuss the extended drive to make lynching a federal crime during the New Deal era of the 1930s. Kate's talk is titled, The Shame of America, the New Deal Senate and the Federal Anti-Lynching Bill. And uh, the talk continues the Bird Center's recent programming, exploring some of the many critical inflection points in American history where Congress engaged broader societal efforts to secure civil rights and racial justice. These efforts, as uh, I think we all know, have produced some monumental highs, including the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and later the civil rights laws of the 1960s. But all too frequently, and for a variety of reasons, more of these efforts came up short than bore fruit. And tonight's talk examines why and how an effort that boasted broad public support during a major period of progressive reform, perhaps the major period of progressive reform in American history, ultimately failed to pass in the Senate. Uh, so it should be a fantastic and compelling talk. Kate Scott is our speaker this evening. She is the Associate Historian of the U.S. Senate Historical Office. The Senate Historical Office serves as the institution's memory, and Kate works on a variety of projects to help fulfill the office's mission. When the Senate is in session, Kate gives weekly history talks to senators. She prepares classified hearing transcripts for publication and provides historical context about current issues and debates to members their staff, and the general public. Kate also uh, gets the privilege of interviewing longtime senators and their staff about how the Senate and American politics have changed over time. And her recent projects have documented women's evolving role in the Senate, including the 40-year battle to win Senate approval of the Women's Suffrage Amendment and the Women of the Senate Oral History Project, a collection of interviews with former women senators and their top staff that document their contributions to our nation's history. Kate is the author of Reigning in the State, Civil Society and Congress in the Vietnam and Watergate Eras, as well as several essays, articles, and chapters about recent US political history. Kate earned her PhD in history at Temple University and her master's at the University of New Mexico. And so I am going to stop talking and I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. <laughs> Thank you, Jay, for that introduction. I appreciate that. Thank you to the Bird Center. Thank you to Jody for providing uh, technical support this evening. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share some of my research about this underexplored topic with you all. Um, I've, I've, I just have been really digging into this topic over the past few months, um, prompted in part by a research question that came into our office about the Senate and its failed effort to pass the anti-lynching bill in the 1930s. It was a topic that I knew a little bit about. I certainly understood that it was a failed effort, but I did not know the contours of that struggle, how long it took, who were the primary uh, opponents and proponents of the measure. And so I took an opportunity in the last few months to really dive into this topic. I mentioned it to Jay and he invited me to be a part of this really cool, um, uh, educational series at the Bird Center. So I am feel really privileged to have the opportunity to share this, uh, some of my research with you. It is a fairly new project for me, so I still have a lot of unanswered questions. There will be much more work needs to be done um, to really understand the broad uh, sweep of this story. 
before I get started, I want to mention to those listening that, of course, this is a very uh, delicate topic. It's a, it's a topic that's in some ways very difficult to speak about. Um, the, the, the brutal practices of lynching um, are described to some extent in the early part of my talk, so I wanted to allow anyone who may not want to hear some of the details of the practice of lynching um, to maybe put me on mute for the first couple of minutes. I describe the evolution of the practice in the United States, and then I move off into the congressional story of the 1930s. Um, but I did want to give you that sort of heads up. In 1934, John Griggs, a black man, was hanged and shot 17 times. His attackers then drug his lifeless body behind a car for hours through the town of Newton, Texas. What was his crime? Griggs had allegedly associated with a white woman. The same year in Manchester, Tennessee, Richard Wilkerson was lynched for the crime of slapping a white man who had assaulted a black woman. In neither of these cases were the perpetrators of these murders identified. And of course, they were not charged with crimes. In 1934, in the, during the early years of the Congressional New Deal, Senate progressives launched a years-long effort to make the practice of lynching, like the ones I've just described, a federal crime. So today I'm going to be sharing with you the story of that failed effort. And what's interesting about this story is that all the while that the Senate failed to pass this bill in the 1930s, a majority of US senators supported the bill. In fact, an overwhelming majority of Americans supported the effort too. One Gallup poll taken in 1937 reported that 72% of their respondents supported the federal anti-lynching bill. 72% of Americans were behind this bill. The same poll reported that a majority of Southerners, more than 50% supported the bill as well. And yet, despite that public support and despite the overwhelming support in the US Senate for the effort, the bill never passed. Why not? That's what I'm going to be exploring in some detail this evening with you. This dramatic and at times shameful chapter in the nation's history illustrates the limits of progressive reform during the New Deal era. The limits of that progressive reform, I think, are really underexplored um, in our larger national history. Now, the practice of lynching is as old as the nation itself. The name actually comes from Charles Lynch and his co-conspirators who used to tar and feather British sympathizers during the Revolutionary War era. As the nation evolved, the practice of lynching evolved with it. On the Western frontier, for example, white settlers used lynching as a means to punish gamblers and horse thieves at a time and in a place where no formal judicial system existed. Beginning in the Reconstruction era, lynching became a practice that was most often reserved for African American suspects. In the decades between the Civil War and World War II, lynch mobs murdered more than 4,700 Americans, and three quarters of those victims were Black men, women, and children. Here's how one U.S. Senator described that 20th century lynching practice. It is a flagrant violation of constitutional rights. It is open anarchy. The victim is seized and held without legal warrant by a lawless mob. He's frequently taken from the custody of peace officers with their active or passive sanction. Accusation is conviction. All rights of fair hearing and trial are brutally and summarily denied. The victim is oftentimes transported, transported from place to place across county or state lines 
Usually by torture, he is driven to utter misery, to meaningless self-indictment. And finally, he is put to death with young and old indiscriminately looking on or participating under crime breeding circumstances of indescribable savagery. Now, efforts to end this barbaric practice in the United States predated the New Deal era. Editor, editor and journalist Ida B. Wells launched an anti-lynching campaign in the 1890s that drew national and international attention to the issue. Her work helped to inspire congressional action. In 1901, Senator George Hoare, a Republican progressive from Massachusetts, introduced an anti-lynching bill in the Senate, but the bill quickly died in committee. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, founded in 1909, made anti-lynching legislation an organizational priority right from the beginning. It closely tracked lynching cases and distributed flyers calling the practice the shame of America. In 1922, the House approved anti-lynching legislation for the first time in the nation's history. And President Warren G. Harding promised that he would sign the bill if it came to his desk. Alas, the bill went down to defeat in the United States Senate, the victim of a filibuster led by Republican Senator William Borah of Idaho. Now, the anti-lynching bill in the 1920s had been a response to the soaring frequency of lynchings, particularly across the South. These atrocities reflected a powerful resurgence of white supremacy, xenophobia, and racial intolerance across broadly American society. In 1925, to just give one example of the ways in which uh, white supremacy had been emboldened in this era, the KKK organized a march of more than 50,000 Americans, members of the organization who marched right down Pennsylvania Avenue in our nation's capital. So four years after that march, the stock market crashed in 1929. And that crisis, combined with tightened credit and a historic drought that swept across the Midwest, plunged the already fragile economy into a crippling depression. By 1932, a presidential election year, the nation's unemployment had reached a historic 25%. These factors helped Franklin Roosevelt unseat a really unpopular incumbent president and boosted Democrats to win huge majorities in both houses of Congress. So at this moment, with this sort of changing political dynamic, the NAACP sensed a political opportunity. And they persuaded freshman Senator Edwin, Edward Costigan of Colorado to introduce a federal anti-lynching bill in the US Senate. Now Costigan's name is not well known today, but he plays a key role in this story. He was a native Virginian educated at Harvard who had built a law practice in Colorado. Um, he also had founded that state's progressive party. He cemented his reputation as a defender of working class Americans when he successfully defended coal strikers who had been accused of inciting violence in the Ludlow Coal Massacre of 1914. After that experience, Costigan held a deep and abiding commitment to representing the interests of the less fortunate and particularly working class Americans. He joined the Senate in 1931 as a Democrat and he came out fighting on behalf of Americans devastated by the Great Depression. Now Costigan agreed to sponsor the NAACP's bill on one condition, that Robert Wagner of New York serve as his co-sponsor. Like Costigan, Wagner had a well-earned reputation for fighting for society's underdogs. At age nine, Bob and his family left Germany to sail for the United States. He was a tenement kid. He grew up on the Lower West Side of Manhattan, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, pardon me. He learned to speak English in New York City public schools. He attended tuition-free city college and he worked his way through law school. Later, he won seats to the New York State Legislature, where he served alongside 
a man by the name of Franklin Roosevelt. In 1911, an industrial tragedy hardened Wagner's nascent progressivism into a really cohesive ideology that he kept close for the rest of his life. The fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company killed 146 workers, most of them women, because company managers had locked the building's emergency exit doors. The tragedy prompted Wagner to investigate working conditions across the state of New York. He interviewed farm workers who regularly worked 19 hour shifts, often with their young children by their side. He observed five year olds who toiled on cannery assembly lines. His final report that he submitted to the legislature laid bare the abhorrent conditions under which many of these laborers, laborers toiled. And it offered, his report also offered some legislative recommendations, most of which were adopted by the state legislature. And those, recommend, those, those adopted uh, legislative measures made New York State a leader in the National Progressive Labor Movement. It wasn't, it, it really wasn't hard for Costigan to convince Wagner to join him to co-sponsor this bill. And they introduced it in early 1934. Their bill was they they hadn't drafted a new bill they actually borrowed heavily from the 1901 bill that had originally been submitted by george hoare of massachusetts and it basically included three components the first the first provision allowed state or local officers to be fined up to five thousand dollars or to be imprisoned for up to five years or both if they were found to have neglected to protect the lives of accused people who were in their custody. The second provision said that if state and local officials failed to prosecute those who had participated in a lynching, then the case would be transferred from their jurisdiction to a federal district court. And then finally, the third provision said that officials in a county in which the lynching had occurred would be subject to financial liability to the victim's family. From between $2,000 to $10,000 they would have to give to the victim if the victim survived or the representatives of that victim. Wagner insisted that every state can retain its autonomy simply by shouldering its responsibilities to protect its citizens, its, rep, its, its residents. So the bill was submitted to the Senate and then referred to the Judiciary Committee and the, the committee, as it normally would, held a hearing on the matter. And Wagner spoke about his support for this bill. He referred to the, what he believed to be the ample legal precedent for federal intervention when state officers deny constitutional rights to their citizens. The U.S. Attorney General, and the Senate Judiciary Committee both came out in support of the bill. Americans liked the bill too, and uh, elected officials like Costigan and Wagner knew that because they received a ton of petitions and letters from citizens across the country um, expressing their support for the bill. I wanted to give you a sense for what those letters sounded like, so I have an example to share with you. This letter was from the Women's Missionary Council of the Methodist Episcopal Church of the South. Whereas the weakness of the local courts give little hope for developing, for delivering us from the terrible situation of violence, they wrote, we hereby give our endorsement to the Costigan Wagner Bill. Newspapers heralded na nationwide support for their bill. White women demand stop to lynching. Call on Roosevelt to eradicate evil rampant in South, screamed one of these headlines. And in the Senate, a, bicart a bipartisan coalition came to the Senate floor to express its support. With class and racial hatreds running rampant, why not strike a blow for mob rule while we can? Those were the words of New Jersey Republican Senator Hamilton Kane. The question remained, would Senate Majority Leader Joe Robinson of Arkansas schedule a vote on the bill? Now, Joe Robinson is, is pictured 
might not be a person uh, that you know well, but he's incredibly influential in the New Deal Senate as Democratic majority leader. Um, here he is in this picture with a big cigar in hand. He's often photographed with a big cigar. Um, and he's regaling the, the, the Senate press corps about something, I'm sure, something important. Among Joe Robinson's many responsibilities as Senate majority leader was the task of managing the Senate calendar. The task didn't necessarily bring him a lot of glory, but it did grant him an extraordinary amount of power, for he and he alone determined which bills the Senate would consider and in which order the Senate would consider those bills. Robinson did not support the bill, and he made that very clear, but he did pledge to schedule a Senate vote on the bill if President Franklin Roosevelt requested one. Over an intimate luncheon in the Rose Garden with the President and Eleanor Roosevelt, Costigan and Wagner argued the merits of their bill. FDR responded coolly. He calculated that forcing a vote would alienate Southern congressional Democrats upon whom he relied to pass his New Deal legislation. He refused to intervene publicly. Consequently, Robinson never called up the bill for consideration, and the Costigan-Wagner bill died when the Senate adjourned sine die in the summer of 1934. During that fall's midterm election, of the midterm election of 1934, Democrats expanded their congressional majorities even further. In the Senate, Democrats picked up 10 Senate seats, which meant that at, at that time they claimed 71 of the chamber's 96 seats. It's an incredibly and historically large majority. In January of 1935, when the new Congress convened, Costigan reintroduced his anti-lynching bill. He dutifully submitted petitions for the record, including those petitions from Southern African Americans who, who were pleading with elected officials to pass the bill. The Senate Judiciary Committee again recommended the bill's passage. When Costigan went around and counted heads for the bill, he had pledges of support from 52 senators, a clear majority. Yet his greatest obstacle remained Southern senators of his own party, including and perhaps especially Joe Robinson. In mid-April, Costigan announced his plans to motion for the bill's consideration. Robinson declared he would not block the measure, but he also would not make any effort on its behalf. He left the procedural issues to the Senate to work out themselves. Uh, he left the procedural issues to the senators, I'm sorry, to work out themselves. South Carolina's Cotton Ed Smith, known for his virulent racist views, objected to Costigan's motion. Nothing to us is more dear than the purity and the sanctity of our womanhood, and so help us God, no one shall violate it without paying the just penalty which should be inflicted upon the beast who invades that sanctity. A week later, Costigan tried again, presenting his motion to proceed to the lynching bill to the Senate. The law is always a measuring rod of civilization, he explained. No man can be permitted to usurp the combined functions of judge, jury, and executioner of his fellow men. And whenever any state fails to protect such equal rights, I submit that the federal government must step in. Costigan's motion was debatable which meant that the bill's opponents could debate whether or not they would even consider the bill, let alone vote for it. And that's when the first filibuster against the federal anti-lynching bill of the New Deal era began. Now, any fans of Frank Capra's classic 1939 film, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, will understand what happened next. The filibuster has a long tradition in the U.S. Senate. The Senate's first rules, which it adopted in 1789, stipulated that no member shall speak more than twice in any single debate. That rule, which frankly was routinely ignored, was the only limit that senators placed upon debate. And as early as 1789, senators were using a strategy that we would recognize today as the filibuster. On September 22, 1789, Pennsylvania Senator William McClay wrote in his diary, the design of the Virginians was to talk away the time so that we could not get the bill passed. 
During World War I, the Senate finally adopted a cloture rule, which, which really means a mechanism by which they could stop debate. But a cloture rule requires a hefty two-thirds majority to end debate. So two-thirds of the senators have to sign on to the cloture motion, uh, have to agree to the cloture motion, rather, to end Senate debate. As one senator explained, free speech in the Senate should be the rule and cloture should be the exception. And so it was. Determined to prevent Costigan's measure from receiving a vote, a small group of no more than 20 Southern Democrats took turns denouncing the bill on the Senate floor. Some argued that the bill was unnecessary, noting that lynchings were declining in number. Others, like Hugo Black of Alabama, made arguments rooted in a deeply contested understanding of American history. A former member of the KKK, who was later appointed by FDR to a seat on the Supreme Court, Black waved the so-called bloody shirt. He insisted that Costigan and Wagner's bill was a lineal descendant of Reconstruction, when the federal government had treated the former Confederate states as conquered provinces and placed the heel of the military oppressor upon the people until they could tolerate it no longer. Outnumbered, Costigan and Wagner took turns defending the bill with cost, with, they, they took turns defending the bill and they were sort of a team in this effort. Costigan would often lean into the moral and ethical arguments, while Wagner would provide much of the legal expertise and rebuttal to the op opponent's claims. As the filibuster marched on, President Roosevelt's silence on the matter spoke volumes. If in America, the black race cannot gain the sympathetic ear of the nation's president, explained the Chicago Defender, one of the nation's leading African-American newspapers, then hope for a satisfactory adjustment of their social, political, and civil rights is impossible. Days went by, then a week, and still the filibuster continued. The anti-lynching bill created a bottleneck, stalling Senate action on a laundry list of the Democrats' legislative priorities, including Wagner's own Social Security bill. Under withering pressure from his colleagues, Costigan reluctantly withdrew his motion. The Senate quickly dispensed with its legislative backlog, approving a rural electrification bill and two of Wagner's landmark offerings, the National Labor Relations Act and the Social Security Act. As the swelter of a Washington summer settled in, the Senate adjourned sine die. Now, even while this debate rolled on in the US Senate, lynchings continued. In September, the details of a gruesome lynching in Oxford, Mississippi shocked the nation. A lynch mob pulled sharecropper Elwood Higginbotham from his jail cell while a jury deliberated the charges that had been made against him. The mob tortured and killed Higginbotham before the jury could deliver its verdict. Later, the sheriff's deputies charged with his protection would not identify anyone who had participated in his murder. When the new Congress convened in 1935, Costigan secured assurances from Senate floor leaders that they would not object to the bill's consideration. But when Costigan signaled his plans to introduce a motion on the Senate floor, his opponents launched a second filibuster. This one lasted only a few days before Costigan withdrew the motion. And though Wagner and Costigan continued to work behind the scenes on behalf of their bill, the remainder of 1935 came and went without, for, without any further Senate debate on their proposal. Now, Wagner alone reintroduced the bill in January of 1936 when Congress convened for its second session. The strain of the previous year's effort had taken a severe toll on Costigan, who had suffered a stroke. He had neither the energy nor the will to continue to fight, and he announced that he wouldn't be seeking re-election that year. It was a presidential election year, and Robinson had no patience for Wagner's proposal. This bill was brought forward during the last session, 
and was discussed for a great many days. It would not be practicable to take it up again during this session. With those words, Robinson effectively killed the bill in 1936. The Senate adjourned sine die with senators dispersing to their party conventions in midsummer. When Democrats convened at their nominating convention in Philadelphia, roving journalists tried to pin senators down on the anti-lynching bill. Where did they stand? Joe Robinson feigned offense at the question. I'm not going to say anything about that now, he sputtered. New Deal's love doesn't extend to lynching law, one reporter concluded. In November 1936, Roosevelt handily won re-election, and Senate Democrats swelled their large majorities even further. The Senate gained a majority of 76, but the Senate now held a majority of 76 seats with an additional four independents who routinely caucused with them, meaning of the Senate's 96 seats, Democrats held, Democrats controlled 80. She's um, amazingly large majorities. Now, Wagner took a few months to plot a new strategy. He recruited a new co-sponsor, Frederick Van Nuys of Indiana, pictured here with his secretary at his desk. Van Nuys was a natural fit for a couple of reasons. He had been one of Wagner's Wagner and Costigan's most reliable and most vocal Senate allies, routinely debating the bill's opponents on the Senate floor. He was also an influential member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So together, Wagner and Van Nuys introduced the anti-lynching bill in January of 1937 at the beginning of the new Congress, and it was quickly referred to committee. The House had passed a bill, and so the pressure was really on the Senate now uh, to do something with this measure. The committee tinkered with the bill, uh, amending it slightly before approving it, uh, before sending it back to the Senate with um, its stamp of approval. Then an unexpected development shifted Wagner and Van Nuys' strategy. In July, Democratic Party leader Joe Robinson died suddenly of a heart attack. Kentuckian Albin Barkley, with the strong backing of President Roosevelt, won a very tight race to replace Robinson as Senate party leader. Though Barclay did not personally support the bill, Wagner believed that he might be more willing to strike a deal to allow the bill to be brought to the floor for a vote. In mid-August of 1937, Wagner made his play, introducing the motion to consider the bill. Predictably, Tom Connolly of Texas objected. And you can see Tom Connolly, again, not a, not a name many will remember from the New Deal era. Tom Connolly of Texas, pictured here on the left, plays a really prominent role in this story. Connolly listed all of the bills awaiting the Senate's consideration, including a sugar bill and a farm relief bill, both of which were dear to Connolly's heart and to the hearts of his constituents. The senator from New York is willing to tie up the legislative program of the session in order to create endless discussion, create embarrassment for the President of the United States, create embarrassment for the leadership of the Senate, simply for the purpose of bringing forth one of the senator's pet measures. Connolly had assumed the role of informal leader of the bill's opposition, and one by one, his colleagues, Southern Democrats all, took to the floor to denounce the delay. As the day turned to evening, Wagner consulted with Barclay, who eagerly struck a deal. Wagner agreed to pull his motion to consider the bill at that time, in exchange for which he asked for the Senate to approve a special order for his bill. A special order is an infrequently used Senate procedure, which allows the Senate to decide a day and time specific when a particular issue, in this case a bill, will be considered by the Senate. 
By securing this special order, Wagner made his bill the Senate's unfinished business in the new Congress that would begin in January of 1938. It would be the Senate's first order of business, and it could not be moved off the calendar until it was dispensed with. By voice vote, senators agreed to this proposal, and then they moved on immediately to dispense with some of these issues that had been waiting on the calendar, including the sugar bill. The Senate adjourned in August of that year. Two months later, President Roosevelt called Congress back for a special session. Battling a creeping recession, FDR offered to Congress a laundry list of legislative musts, including a tax bill and a bill to reform and reorganize the executive branch. The president, of course, had not mentioned Wagner's bill. He, after all, did not publicly support it. But for reasons that remain unclear to me, something I'm going to have to explore further, Wagner attempted to call up his anti-lynching bill under the previously agreed to special order. Tempers immediately flared. Tom Connolly denounced the bill. Outrageous, I denounce it! And unleashed a series of verbal attacks on Wagner, on the majority leader, and on other members as well. And that's when a filibuster began. This is the third filibuster against the bill by my count in as many years. The special session called to pass emergency legislation was slipping away. Josiah Bailey of North Carolina insisted that Wagner put aside his bill. No Negroes are going to be lynched in the next two months, he insisted, but thinking of what is gonna to happen to the country. Let us withdraw the bill. Let us get to work. As the debate wore on, the senators received word that the long delayed farm bill was ready for their consideration. After receiving assurances from the majority and the minority leaders that his bill would still have priority under the provisions of the standing special order, Wagner agreed to postpone consideration of his bill during the, re the remainder of that special session. And so Wagner's bill became the Senate's first order of business on January 6th, 1938. And on that day, the bill's opponents launched another filibuster to block the bill, the fourth filibuster on this bill thus far. Southern Democrats controlled the floor time. They talked and talked, sometimes about Wagner's bill, sometimes about other issues. Hattie Carraway of Arkansas, the only woman serving in the Senate at that time and the first woman to be elected to the United States Senate, joined the effort. I do not think this is a filibuster, she said. This is a debate which has placed the issue before the people in such a way that the whole country now knows there is more involved to it than the mere prevention of lynchings. Using every parliamentary procedure available to them, Connolly and his colleagues tied the Senate in knots. They chastised the bill's proponents who, frankly, based on the transcripts of the proceedings that I've reviewed, seemed to be largely absent from the debate. Day after day, the filibuster went then week after week. Albin Barkley let it roll on and on, routinely recessing the Senate for the day at 5 p.m. and thereby never testing the limits of the filibusterer's stamina. A month went by. An exasperated Wagner urged his colleagues to voice their support for the bill on the Senate floor. A few did, though tellingly, most of the bill's proponents remained silent. Twice, Wagner started a cloture petition, gathering signatures from his colleagues to end the filibuster. Twice, he failed to gather the required support of two-thirds of the senators for, to end debate on the bill. Even those who supported the legislation worried about setting a precedent to cut off Senate debate. Five weeks came and went, and still the filibuster continued. Senators grew cranky. Tempers flared. A few members needled their colleagues on the Senate floor. The filibuster continued with senators repeating earlier arguments against the bill. Some called the bill a federal overreach. Others defended states' rights. A few senators, including Connolly, declared that the proposal was unconstitutional. 
And in the filibuster's last gasp, the racial innuendos became much more frequent than they had been in earlier debates. If the Senate relented to pressure from African Americans to pass this bill, one senator wondered aloud in the Senate chamber, would the victory merely embolden them? What would they demand next? To ride in railroad cars with white passengers? Would they demand the vote, the right to vote in Democratic primary elections in the South? If the Democratic Party aligns itself with African American interests, warned another Southern Democrat, it may lose support in the Solid South. Wagner faced his prospects honestly. I am enough of a realist in this matter to know that unless cloture is agreed to, we cannot obtain a vote on the anti-lynching bill. As week six of the filibuster rolled around, Wagner's determination waned. The filibuster had consumed 34 days of Senate business, including two Saturday sessions. All the while, the president's must-pass legislation had backed up on the Senate calendar, blocked by the anti-lynching bill. Now under extraordinary political pressure, Wagner agreed to postpone consideration of his bill on February 21st, 1938, in order to make way for other legislative priorities. Senators, sensing his defeat, gathered in the chamber for the last moments of debate. In barely restrained tones, a few of the bill's proponents blamed Barkley. The majority leader could have broken the filibuster at any time, they insisted, by holding the Senate in all-night sessions. Barkley blamed Republican leader Charles McNary of Oregon. While nobody holds the Republican minority, small as it is, responsible for the failure to obtain cloture, they have not raised their voices on behalf of this bill. McNary blamed Wagner. It would be futile again to bring this bill before the Senate unless he can show more genuine enthusiasm for the me measure than he has shown so far. There seemed to be ample blame to go around. George Norris, a progressive Republican of Nebraska and father of the Tennessee Valley Authority, had the final word on the federal anti-lynching bill of the New Deal era. Though he believed that the bill was constitutional, he insisted its passage would damage relations between Northern and Southern states, reviving old animosities from the Civil War era. The crime of lynching has been gradually dying out, he explained. The people of the South have made a record of which they have a right to be proud. The Senate voted immediately after Norris's speech with Wagner and Van Eyes joining 56 of their colleagues in a vote to lay their bill aside thereby making way for emergency relief appropriations. And with this vote, the New Deal Congress drove the last nail in the coffin of the federal anti-lynching bill. So I wanna close out this story with a couple of observations, a couple of things for us to think about. One is that this story demonstrates that one party control of the White House and both chambers of Congress is no guarantee of legislative success, no matter how large the majorities uh, are in, in, those, in those chambers of Congress. Because the party, the Democratic Party, was so divided on this issue, um, it was the Democratic Party actually that blocked the issue. Secondly, I think that Examining these stories of failure, particularly during an era like the New Deal, when we so often think of congressional legislative success stories, it, it complicates our understanding of this era. It adds a new layer to the story um, and, a new, and, and it makes the story far more complex. I do think that we need to spend more time thinking about the times that legislation fails to be enacted, particularly the times when legislation fails to be enacted in spite 
of great overwhelming public support for a measure. You know, I've, I've got the slide up here for us to show um, a Gallup poll in 1937. I, I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk, a Gallup poll in 1937 reported that 72% of Americans supported a federal anti-lynching bill. Even 57% of Southerners supported that bill. And yet Democrats were not able to turn, a, the bill's proponents were not able to turn that public opinion into enough political pressure to make this bill into law. And, and, and then finally, the last thought is when, when we celebrate sort of when, when we celebrate or commemorate the legislative successes of the New Deal era, and we talk about the, those successes as evidence of the era's progressive nature, I think we need to really think carefully about what we mean when we talk about progressivism of the New Deal era. We need to understand that when it came to issues of addressing systemic racial injustice, um, New Deal progressives failed in a number of ways, not only with the anti-lynching bill, although that one seems to be the most obvious case, um, but also in another, in a, across a, a broad, a broad uh, swath of the, of the New Deal legislative accomplishments. And I think we need to take those things into consideration when we consider the legislative legacy of the New Deal era. There's an interesting postscript to this story, um, and I'll just, it may be something that comes up in the Q&A period, so I'll just end the talk there, and, and hopefully we can just jump right into a, a, a good uh, Q&A and discussion about this topic. I'm interested in hearing your, your thoughts and comments about it. Thanks so much. Oh, is, is the date of the last lynching known and how far north and west did lynchings occur? That's a great question. Um, I'll answer, I'll, I'll go with the second part of the question first. You, what I recommend is anyone who wants to know more about the history of lynching in this country, I, I suggest that you visit the website that has been created by the Equal Justice Initiative. It's a fabulous website. Much of the history uh, of lynching that I told today is drawn from their, um, they, have, they have a short, a brief history of lynching in America. And then they've, they've taken the data that they can, that has been gathered over time, much of it that they've gathered themselves. And they've identified on a national map exactly where those lynchings took place and the dates and they've provided as much of the underlying sources as they can to support those particular incidents. It's what's really interesting about it is that you notice that uh, while a, a vast majority of lynchings took place in the southeast of the United States, and particularly in the former Confederate states, there were lynchings in Washington state, there were lynchings in California. I mean, it goes all across the nation. Um, so I, I recommend that any of you who, who want to know more about this particular topic, go visit that Equal Justice Initiative website. It's fantastic. Um, really, really useful. Uh, to your question about when was the last known lynching recorded, I have in my mind that it's somewhere, that it's sometime in the 1960s, but I think that's wrong. <laughs> I actually wonder if it was the early 1980s, and I've, I've got to go back and take a look at that. It was, it was certainly in the second half of the 20th century. I know that for sure. Kate, um, sorry. Oh, no, go, go ahead if, um, if you have uh, one more question. When was the bill finally passed this year? <laughs> That's a great question. And that leads to my postscript. Um, one of the things that I'll be exploring as I continue on with this project is the, the next failed effort in the Senate to pass anti-lynching legislation, and that was in the, 19, the late 1940s. Again, driven um, a, a, with a lot of, of um, with a great deal of support by the NAACP and the, um, 
and the returning veterans from World War II who demanded that the United States have a public accounting for its uh, long history of racial injustice. In the 1940s, the Senate grapples with this issue again, and I, I, I need to know more about that story. It doesn't pass legislation in the 1940s, um, and the postscript that I wanted to mention to you actually is that um, in 2005, the Senate passed a really interesting uh, resolution in, in June of that year. They passed it, they approved it unanimously, and the resolution stated that it was an apology to the victims of lynching from the United States Senate for, and, and to their descendants. Apolog an apology to the victims of lynching, lynching and to their descendants from the United States Senate for its failure to pass the, Cost the Costigan-Wagner bill in the 1930s. And one senator explained in his presentation of this, of this resolution, which was approved unanimously, that transforming our nation requires that we recall all of our history. Um, there, there continues to be some legislative debate about an anti, the need for an anti-lynching bill, and that's, I believe, been very, very recently within the last couple of years. Um, but to, to date, the United States Senate has, has not passed an, a federal anti-lynching bill. Hey, we have a couple questions, yeah. and thanks so much for that really yeah. Fascinating, fascinating talk. Um, Ray has asked, you know, uh, and this I guess is maybe a bit of a more procedural question. If Barkley adjourned the Senate at the end of each day, how was the filibuster able to pick up where it left off uh, each each subsequent morning? Yeah, so that was he was he was recessing the Senate, and the next day it, there was <laughs> that. What was so interesting is that you can see them planning things out in the in the sort of the Senate wrap up at the end of each day, mm. with the filibustering member saying, "Okay, if we're about to go out, what's going to happen to me tomorrow?" <laughs> and they're literally like on the floor figuring this out with the Senate Majority Leader, with the parliamentarian weighing in. Um, with the vice president often weighing in saying, yes, you will be recognized tomorrow morning or you will have to seek the acknowledgement of the chair first. And they, they really did sort of hone this mechanism to where every day they would, they would be able to um, maintain that filibuster. Wow. Uh, so Betty has asked, if Wagner and Van Nuys had so much support from other proponents of the bill, why did those other senators remain so silent? Why didn't they voice stronger support for the anti-lynching bill? Yeah, that's, that is something that I want to do a lot. Uh, I, ne I need to do a lot more research to better understand what's going on there. So some of what I've been doing, frankly, because of the pandemic, I've been fairly restricted in the kinds of sources that I can examine really closely to figure out what's going on. Most of the sources that I'm using are the congressional record for the debates. And fortunately, a lot of the members are talking about some of the behind the scenes deals that they're making, which I love when they do that on the Senate floor, but they don't always do that. Uh, some of the newspapers are also accounting for these behind the scenes deals and they're identifying some members like, oh, so-and-so is definitely for the bill. Talked to me in the hallway and said, I definitely support the bill. But the funny thing is, is that those folks don't show up in the congressional record. They're not making speeches. They're not taking part in the debate. They're not intervening into the filibuster to try to um, refute the charges being made by the opponents. And I don't understand why. I really don't understand why they're silent. I have a few um, suspicions. I suspect, for example, that the Republicans, there were many Republicans who support, who went on record saying, I support the bill. R record being they would tell journalists in the hallways, they would speak at news conferences, they would answer questions and say, yes, I support the bill. Sometimes even in on the Senate floor, they would say, oh yeah, of course I support the bill. But they wouldn't engage in sort of extended debate on it. Um, my, my suspicion is that the Republicans felt like the Democrats were doing damage to themselves and the Republicans were okay letting them 
tear themselves up over this issue. I mean, you know, having an 80 seat majority seems like they, that means that they would be able to wield all kinds of political power, but actually this issue drove deep divisions, existing divisions, but it drove deeper wedges into those divisions and, and took people farther apart. So I think the Republicans, from McNary's perspective, um, I think he was happy to let the Democrats sort of fight it out. <laughs> and also, given that the public supported the measure and the Democrats with that overwhelming majority couldn't secure its passage, it made them look really bad. So I think the Republic, you know, this is a tactic that Lyndon Johnson uses when he's majority leader during the um, McCarthy era, he's like the, you know, the McCarthy's the Republicans problem. I'm just going to, the Democrats are going to stay out of it. He lets them work it out because it's a party division and, and it, it, there's no need to weigh in, wade into it. I also think McNary coming forward at the end and saying, well, actually, I don't know what he's talking about when he's talking about Wagner's, I mean, Wagner did this year after year while he was doing all these other things. So I don't think he lacked <laughs> enthusiasm for the project. He was probably just exhausted. But I do think the points that some Republicans made about the leader's unwillingness to sort of break the filibuster by holding them in all night sessions, that's true. You know, that, that makes sense. I, I can understand um, their frustration with his, um, with Barclay's lack of willingness to do that. Um, so in, there are a lot of, there's a lot of uh, information here that I simply don't have. When, when people won't speak on the Senate floor, won't reveal their support for a bill, what does that mean? Is there support, uh, you know, is there broad support in the Senate, but it's really shallow support? <laughs> That's probably what's likely. So like, you know, the idea that sometimes what's not being said is, is as if not more important than what is being said. Yeah. One of the things that's I think is interesting about all of this, and I think it gets to your point about focusing at least somewhat or or more on the failures, is when we when we think about the the New Deal as sort of specifically excluding minorities across the board. Yeah. It's generally framed as, you know, sort of a byproduct of just trying to get all of this other progressive legislation passed, right? And sort of the idea of this new conservative block that sort of tangles things up for the next 20 or 30 years kind of emerges out of this. But this seems like this is a driving issue. Like, it does, does this kind of maybe change the paradigm a little bit? Like, this is where all of that coalesces around and sort of ripples out in a different way? Because they're talking about all this particular bill in the middle of all of those other conversations. Roosevelt is not inaugurated till March of 1933. It's right in the smack, smack in the middle of all of this. Mm -hmm. You know what, it's what well, I'll say this, it's really forcing me to think about the New Deal Senate yeah. differently, right? And I see some of these, I mean, look, I end my talk very intentionally with George Norris, who some people, you know, may not know George Norris. In the Senate, George Norris has this, um, uh, he's, he's Mr. Progressive Republican. You know, he has this long Senate career um, fighting for progressive causes, but progressive for who? You know, by today's standards, yeah, he's, he's, he is a progressive, um, but I mean, I think we still evaluate him today as a progressive, but it's interesting to think of a progressive, you know, we also call William Bohr of Idaho a progressive, and he's, he's someone I didn't talk much about in my story, but he and Norris both um, have these progressive Republican credentials, but on the issues of race, man, they're just, they, they are racist. I mean, for, for, for Norris to say that in the end is, is so interesting to me. It makes, it makes his legacy, to, for me, a lot more complicated when I think about his New Deal accomplishments, particularly something like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which helped electrify the Southeast, the rural portions of the Southeast, which of course did change the communities that a lot of African Americans lived in. But it does mean that he has a more complicated legacy. So I'm thinking about it, frankly, Jay, at sort of the more individual level, because I love these individual stories. But it, it's partly for me because I love the idea that individuals can hold these um, contradictory sort of ideas, mm -hmm. as I think we all do, 
um, yeah. you know, in within themselves and then how do they work through them or in what in what ways do those contradictions become really evident. Um, that's that's the, along the lines of what I've been thinking about when I've been thinking about some of these prominent figures from the New Deal era. Yeah. When you when you really think about who's benefiting from these programs and who is intentionally being left out, mm -hmm. it really changes. Um, it changes the story and it should, you know, it needs, I think our stories need to be a lot more complicated. We need to allow for and embrace that complexity because that's the human experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And speaking of prominent figures during the period, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. the question is, uh, did, did Eleanor Roosevelt, mm -hmm. you know, who was so outspoken, um, on, on racial issues express, a voice publicly or privately on this? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I did have her in the story and then for reasons of time, I had to take her out because look, I already talked too long anyway. <laughs> and she's not a congressional figure. She's not in the Senate. So I had to leave some people out. But um, Eleanor, of course, is pushing FDR, pushing FDR, pushing FDR. But he's reminding her, reminding her, reminding her that he needs Southern conservative Democrats to pass these New Deal programs. And so, you know, she's, she's there at that Rose Garden luncheon and she's listening to it and she, she's taking it all in. She talks to Wagner. She tries to assure them that she'll work behind the scenes to change his mind, but she's never able to do that. So a very prominent woman who takes a very prominent position on this very conf, um, on this very controversial issue, frankly, um, during the New Deal era, but she's not able to sway FDR. Um, boy, if she had, what what would the possibilities have looked like? I also think, you know, the other point here, the really important inflection point is the two majority leaders mm -hmm. because they have a lot of power and neither one of them supports the bill. Yes. So, you know, that's certainly a, an underexplored piece of this story. They are the gatekeepers for New Deal legislation. Yeah, very, very much so. Do you have a sense for um, what the, what sort of the broader kind of consequence of this is in terms of sort of uh, the popular reception to this failure? Like, is it kind of a, a cause celeb kind of thing? Does it sort of just sort of, you know, kind of quietly go away as we begin the ramp up towards World War II and all of that? I mean. That's a great question. And one of the things that I need to pursue as I continue to expand this story, sort of uh, chronologically, um, I suspect that, I, so searching the congressional record, I don't see any evidence that in 1939, for example, this issue comes to the Senate floor again. Which is weird yeah. because he's, you know, Wagner's a powerful dude. He's been pushing this for years. How could it just die like that? Mm -hmm. um, so I need to explore that some more. Um, I, I think, frankly, you know, one of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk about is the context in which the conservatives start to rebel against FDR. <laughs> you yeah. know, we, we do have the, the effort to reform the, the judiciary in this, um, you know, that's, people say that's possibly what killed Joe Robinson is him overworking, being overworked by FDR, trying to push through this plan that the Southern conservatives in the Senate don't like. Um, and um, so I think that this piece is an, yet another piece of sort of the Southern conservative revolt and, and, and a, dis, a turning point for them and like, how much can we push back on this popular president? Mm -hmm. And it turns out they can push back a lot. <laughs> yeah, that that is that's certainly the case. There's no doubt about that. And why can they do it? Because politically, there's a one party system in the South and African Americans are denied access to the ballot. So there aren't political consequences for Southern conservatives um, pushing back against an otherwise very popular president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I don't want to monopolize this conversation, Kate, and I can talk all day about these things. So I feel like we're in one of our grad sessions, Jay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, if anybody else so wants to jump in. Please do submit uh, additional questions. 
Uh, one of the things is kind of interesting for me as I've kind of taught this period and has been sort of looking at just kind of the broader federal taking up of, of civil rights issues. And, you know, you see some action from the executive branch, you know, with, um, with Roosevelt's executive orders for, you know, uh, war contracts and then Truman desegregating the military later through executive order. And you begin to see, you know, in the late forties, Thurgood Marshall and sort of taking the, the cases to the Supreme Court and getting some favorable court rulings. And so it's interesting that, that Congress is the branch that seems to move the slowest in all of this. And I, I wonder if there's kind of a, a sense among the members as this is playing out that, you know, um, that that is the case. And whether that's on purpose or not, I mean. Yeah, I, here's what I would tell you. Based on the sources that I was using for today's talk, I don't see that. Mm. Um, I don't see a discussion of this taking too much time. I see a lot of exasperation mm. um, about the procedure um, and how, how much it can muck up the process, and intentionally so. Um, but I don't see the members complaining about that slow movement. And again, it's worth repeating here. People here will know this, but it's just worth mentioning again. Of course, there were no black senators in the New Deal Congresses, right? The, we don't have our first popularly elected African-American senator um, until the 1960s when Ed Brooks of, of Massachusetts is elected. So we you know, to the extent that African Americans are demanding and, you know, fighting for this bill and insisting upon um, its necessity, they have to do so from outside the institution. Um, there isn't anyone with that perspective serving in the Senate. And it's useful for us to be reminded of that because I think sometimes we forget. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and also just in terms of Congress, you know, it's, it's sort of the A. Philip Randolphs and stuff who are bringing, you know, the most voice to these issues during, during the war. And, and that's reflective of the changing demographics, but there's, there's a lag, right? Be, between when you're sort of have enough in a, in a particular congressional district to elect a member and, uh, you know, gain a voice in sort of a statewide election, like, like, like Senate, right? Oh, so much to think about. <laughs> <I know. laughs> so many things that I still haven't figured out, you know? Yeah. Well, so <laughs> Maybe I'll come back and do like a, a shame of America part two. <laughs> Did you want to talk a little bit about sort of where the title came from? Um, and it was oh, sure. that first document because it's such a powerful document. Yeah. So this is, I'm so embarrassed that this didn't work because of course, when we tried this initially, it worked just fine before yeah. the talk. Um, yep. But let me see if I can show you very quickly the images that I prepared. And I'm, again, I'm just not sure why this isn't working, but let me try it one more time. Um, see if I can get this to work. Looks like my computer freezes up. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, oh, there we go. So the shame of America, the title itself comes from a flyer. And I'll take this opportunity to mention to everyone um, that the images um, that I'm about to show you all come from the Library of Congress. This is a flyer uh, printed by the NAACP um, around the time of the 1922 federal anti-lynching bill, which passed the House, as I mentioned. Um, and, and they call, you know, that was the NAACP's labeling. They called lynch, the, the, the practice of lynching the shame of America. And they, they framed it within this context of, uh, let me see if I've got it a little bit bigger here. Um, you know, do you know that the, the United States is the only land on earth where human beings are burned at the stake? And then they, they give some pretty terrible statistics about the number of people who have been lynched in the country in 30 years. Um, and, and a little reference to, you know, is rape the cause of lynching? Something that a, a common 
uh, a common argument that Ida B. Wells tried to um, refute um, with her pamphlet in the in the 1890s. But the shame of America, I stole the title shamelessly <laughs> from this fabulous NAACP flyer because I thought, you know, that is a bold statement to make. And that was in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Ray has uh, asked or said, you know, the Democratic Party had a Southern segregation southern segregationist wing and a northern wing could the party have not wanted a fight over this <laughs> yeah that's a great point ray of course um and and i think that that really that goes back to fdr's decision not to intervene um as as i mentioned earlier i do think that uh, for some people the the keeping the party united was absolutely imperative and any issues because the nation was in uh in a crisis in a historic economic crisis um and in order to address the crisis the way that fdr and other members of congress of course i mean a lot of these ideas come from members of congress the way that they wanted to address it they believed they needed to promote party unity um and so yeah i, I think that you know, issues like lynching were um arguably wedge issues that could divide the party um northern uh senators perhaps were leery of that southern senators um used it you use the prospect of division to their advantage because this is not legislation that they wanted to become law um, and I, and I think, you know, that's the, that's sort of the political calculations that go into it. On the other hand, what if a few of the senators had been more bold in their statements? What if they had embraced the issue, um, and ran with it, particularly knowing that they had public opinion behind them? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's one of those what ifs and we won't know, but it's, it's kind of a fascinating, uh, it's it's a fascinating moment to think about what were the options here. I mean, that piece about public opinion, frankly, is not something I knew until I did the work for this talk. And um, and that was a Gallup poll. I can show you, actually, I've got it right here. It was a Gallup poll um, conducted in the fall of 1937. And Dr. George Gallup himself wrote the, <laughs> the column. Um, saying that his poll showed how many, an overwhelming majority of Americans favored the anti-lynching legislation. Um, now, was that an, was that an evolving uh, public support? It may have been in 1933, maybe those numbers looked really different. Um, but over the course of the debate, did, did the public support for such a measure swell? And if so, could the Democrats have handled it differently? I think it's entirely possible. It's it's fascinating to think about. Did you um, did you happen to look or get at any kind of constituent correspondence or anything like that? I mean, do we get a sense for how people are responding to this and engaging with their member, with their senator? So the short answer is the constituent correspondence that I've been able to see during the pandemic has been whatever has been submitted in the record. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for me, um, a lot of the senators and particularly Costigan was really good about this. He would often come to the Senate floor with a pile of letters and say, I'm submitting these for the record. And then they, and then so that I had access to that constituent correspondence. I suspect uh, because of some of the, other sources that I've read that Costigan was also turning those letters over to the Senate Judiciary Committee. So at some point when I have access to the Judiciary Committee records at the National Archives in Washington, I hope to get down there and really explore that piece of this puzzle. You know, how were Americans communicating their feelings about this legislation to their members of Congress? And then, you know, is there evidence that there was a lot of public support in 1933, in 1934? And that that will even, that may even complicate the story further. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think where you're kind of talking about these big issues, you know, particularly the latter half of the decade when the depression is still so deep and clearly there's a, a massive global event emerging and the neutrality acts are being passed so that you know i wonder 
if this is just kind of a a thing where they're not willing to spend the capital on it it's just kind of not that important to them which kind of given given the numbers seems kind of particularly odious but you know i do this goes back a little bit to an earlier question that you posed to about um i think it was betty's question about why um why why senators pledged their support but then didn't go down and speak their support on the senate floor and i do suspect that the support for this bill was broad and shallow <laughs> so people would maybe go on record to say or would would tell wagner and costigan absolutely i support the bill but then when it came to like are you going to put your shoulder against the wheel and actually make this happen they were not willing to do that mm -hmm. and I do think that probably goes back to racial attitudes of the time. Um, I do think there were political calculations. The, the Southern senators liked to say on the Senate floor during the course of the filibuster, they liked to taunt some of the um, members who, um, who would say that they were for the bill and they would say, well, you have no political gain to be made. You have no, you have no Negroes, to use the word that they used at the time. You have no Negroes in your state. And Costigan used to bring that up. He would say, I have, there's no political upside to this for me because I have very few African American residents in the state of Colorado. Um, I suspect, frankly, that people were, would have supported the bill as long as they didn't have to work for the bill. And that's where the, 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 the burden was on the shoulders of Costigan and Wagner and later Wagner and Van Eyes. And I just think it was, it was too much for them to carry, frankly. Um, actually, Betty has just uh, contributed a question that was making me think as you were kind of talking about this and your, your point earlier about sort of the breadth and the scope of lynching in America. Um, were Western senators vocal on the lynching of Hispanic Americans mm -hmm. or other people of color? Because we know that, you know, um, it certainly wasn't solely focused on African Americans. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is an interesting point that kind of cuts two ways. In 1933, there's a, a another terrible lynching uh they're all terrible but this is a this is a lynching that occurs i believe in southern california um and it and and three i want to say three latinos are hanged um no that can't be right i'm, I'm i think it's three three white men and it actually, for Costigan sees it as an opportunity to present the problem of lynching as not one where Northern and Western folks are trying to impose something on Southerners. <laughs> he sees it as a chance to say, look, lynching is happening across the country. It's horrible no matter whom it happens to. And this law will apply to everyone, right? Um, it will apply to everyone in the same way. So that Costigan saw that terrible episode as kind of something he could use in his political calculations. Um, on the other hand, Southerners would often, in their speeches on the Senate floor, would often make the point that um, they would they would often say, uh, you know, you talk about mob activity, a mob being defined as three people or more engaging in this type of behavior and and they liked to tease wagner um and say you know there's a lot of gang activity in new york is this is this anti-lynching bill going to apply to gangsters and mobsters they used to like to use those terms a lot they would often make that argument to the the gentleman the senator from illinois who was the the whip the democrats whip they would often say to him, um, you know, there's a lot of gang activity in Chicago. Is this bill going to apply to gangs in Chicago? And there's a whole other story just about that argument that I had to hold off to the side for this talk because it's actually quite complicated. There's some, 
they they amend the bills in ways to specify that it actually won't apply to gangsters and it actually won't apply to mobsters. <laughs> so that gives the Southerners like a wedge to be able to say, look at what you're doing. You're actually making it so your own constituents won't be subject to this bill. Um, but anyway, that's an aside. There was plenty of discussion on the Senate floor about the fact that lynching was a problem across the country. And in, the, in, in any case, when, when Costigan and Wagner had the opportunity to bring up the fact that people besides African Americans were also lynched, they would, they would take that opportunity to remind people that there were a variety of victims, um, uh, including some um, Italian Americans in Louisiana in the 1930s. Um, so yeah, senators were aware that the problem was not restricted, just that, that African Americans were not the only victims and they would often talk about that in the debates on the Senate floor. Um. Ray has no noted that Claude Pepper is in the picture that is on mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. screen. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to uh, sort of talk a little bit about where you got your images and all of that kind of thing? Sure. This is, um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when, as I, one of the things that we've been talking about in our office for some time is thinking about uh, the origins of the the Southern Caucus, which is a group of senators in the in the Senate. In the in the that that science that so, frankly that that coalesce they're typically democratic um, conservative Democrats from the South who coalesce around um, their opposition to issues related any kind of civil rights legislation and 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 Betty and I have been talking about this for some time like how how would we trace the origins of the Southern Caucus. Um, and we have talked about for some time the fact that we think that the origins of the Southern Caucus, their mobilizing strategy, the way that they developed their, um, their really uh, organized um, filibustering procedures, like they were really organized when they filibustered. We think that the origins are probably around this, this uh, federal anti-lynching legislation in the 1930s. So possibly the dean of the uh, the Southern Caucus is actually Tom Connolly of Texas, who's pictured here on the left. Um, uh, Claude Pepper was certainly a member of that group, a longtime senator from the state of Florida. And then we've got the gentleman smiling in the back, looking at the camera, the tallest man in the photo, Richard Russell, um, uh, who became the dean of the Southern um, of the of the Southern Democratic Caucus in the 1950s and in the 1960s organized all of the filibusters against civil rights legislation, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And he was a young and fairly new senator in the 1930s. Um, and, and, and I think he learned, he developed some of his strategies watching Connolly sort of rally the Southern Democrats against the anti-lynching legislation in the 1930s. Um, so I picked this photo because I, I saw Richard Russell there with Connolly and I thought, wow, I, I wish I, I wish I could know more about what they were talking about, <laughs> <laughs> you know, during this, uh, this, this is another Library of Congress photo. Um, yeah. But here we have four very powerful members of the Democratic Party, um, all from the South and gosh, what are they talking about? <laughs> how, how long had Connolly been in the Senate when this is going on? Yeah, that's a good question, Jay. And I don't know that off the top of my head. I could look it up. I, I suspect that he came in in the 19 teens, mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I don't know that for sure. Interesting. I can, we can certainly look it up. If you go to bioguide.congress.gov, you can look up <laughs> every member of the United yeah. States Congress. Betty, Betty <laughs> I'll make a plug for that website because it's so useful. Betty, there was, I, I, just Betty, to point Betty. out, like nobody knows what Costigan looked like. There's Costigan. Um, there's Wagner. People are probably much more familiar with him. Um, Costigan and Wagner, we literally have these cool photos of them developing their strategy <laughs> during these Judiciary Committee hearings about the bill in 1933 and 1934. Um, Joe Robinson, of course, with a big old cigar in his hand, <laughs> uh, you know, regaling the, the assembled press corps with some fabulous story, I'm sure. Um, there's Ben Eyes, another gentleman you might not be familiar with, and then uh, Alvin Barkley mm -hmm. of, of Kentucky. 
So Jody, it said Senator Connolly served in the Senate from 1929 until 1953. He served in the House from 1917 to 1929. Oh, well, he had a long house service prior to his Senate service. That's interesting. Thank you, Jody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are these are fantastic images. And, you know, kind of because our collections here are so focused on post-World War II, it's really interesting to see the same framing and the mm -hmm. same kind of, you know, uh, positioning of the, you know, of the images. And, oh, like the staging of the photos? Yeah, Is that what yeah, you're thinking? Yeah. 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 Like, yeah, I mean, uh, sit let me sit down at my desk and you can take pictures of me doing work. <laughs> yeah. so there's, you know, the phones are different, you know, yeah. it's a very similar thing. Uh, Jay? Yes, sir. Uh, if I could break in for a moment, this is Ray Smock. Uh, and just to say that uh, this is, thank you, uh, Kate, this has been uh, absolutely wonderful. And, uh, but I, I, as I watch this and as I listen to it and as I see the pictures now, uh, this is an ancient history. Uh, Claude Pepper, when he was in the House of Representatives, was chairman of the Rules Committee, mm -hmm. and he did the search, uh, conducted the search, that hired me as the first House historian. <laughs> and so, and it was it was Claude Pepper, who uh, told me that uh, as historian I should deal with the peaks and the valleys of the history wow. of the House, nice, and, and not just uh, uh, deal with the the highlights. And what you're doing <laughs> right now is doing what Claude Pepper asked of me. You're dealing with the peaks and the valleys, and that's where you'll find the story in its in its totality, and not mm -hmm. just in not just in uh, writing some glorification of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you so much for what you're doing, Kate. Oh, Ray, thanks so much. I love that peaks and valleys. That's the perfect way to describe the work, isn't it? It's really that's really good, and I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that I'm talking to you and you once talked with Claude Pepper. <laughs> like, that's really cool. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, Claude Pepper was a very active member of the filibustering group against the anti-lynching, the federal anti-lynching bills. He comes up again and again and again and again. Wow. And, yeah. yet, and yet he was one of the great uh, liberals of, this, of, of the Senate and he lost his seat because exactly. he, was, he was for uh, 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 equal pay for women and universal health care. Those were very radical ideas and they called him Red Pepper mm. for his socialist views in 1935. <laughs> and isn't that interesting, Ray, to think about, um, right, to think about the complexity of his career and also to think about him advising you um, to treat history and all of its complexities and study the peaks and valleys. And then frankly, knowing that he's a part of some of those valleys, right? Absolutely. And that he played a role in, in the history of some of those valleys. That's, that's so interesting. And that's, that's a great story because it just speaks to the, the complexity of what it means to be a human being, <laughs> really. I like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ray. That's fantastic. Um, and we are, we've been going for an hour and a half now, which is fantastic. Uh, but I will encourage anybody, if you have one last question for Kate, please, please um, ask it now. And um, otherwise, maybe we'll wrap this up. <laughs>